Hi guys, this is jsendon.com and I'm here with a handset called the Samsung Galaxy Alpha, the famous Alpha, the handset that started it all, and by all I mean the metal edges, finally a device that brought metal to the Galaxy family. This is the first partially metal Samsung phone in recent history, it's a new design chapter for the company, it was announced in August, launched in September, and we're testing it right now, right here at gsendom.com. The price tag? Of this device on amazon.com is $640 and it's pretty much a flagship price for a smaller phone and by the way we're testing the Exynos version of the device here so in thickness it measures 6.7 millimeters so it's an ultra thin handset it's one of the thinnest handsets produced by Samsung ever it has a 4.7 inch screen and uh, meanwhile the iPhone 6 measures 6.9 millimeters so it's actually thinner even compared to the iPhone 6 which is quite an achievement. Okay, other stuff worth mentioning, the weight 115 grams, so quite light and it sits well in the user's hand, it's well proportioned and everything feels well in the user's hand. The one hand use is easy, you can reach every area of the screen you want with no hassle, so it's comfortable to hold, it has a good grip and uh, I have to say that just like the Galaxy Note 4, the metal edges are quite rough on your hand. They cut into your palm during long phone calls and also the edge of the screen is a bit uh, higher than the rest of the phone as you can see here. And it can uh, cut into your skin if you do this a couple of times, you can lose your epiderma. So you can get it peeled, you can get your skin peeled on these edges. So overall, sharp metal edges that tend to cut into your palm. And I'm being extreme here, they don't exactly cut, they cut, so they leave a mark on your palm. So that goes to say, uh, they're not very comfy. This phone comes in black, uh, silver, white, gold, blue, and it's a good looking and elegant phone. I'll give it that much, it has aluminum sides, but the finishing for me leaves a bit to be desired it doesn't feel as high-end as other metal phones, so the finishing is not as impressive. We got, uh, let's close this, we got a dotted pattern at the back and a dotted pattern at the front. If you look closely at the white areas, you'll see the dots. Okay, this is a compact phone, it feels like a Galaxy S5 mini and it actually resembles it a bit. It's not waterproof in case you're wondering and it has great build quality, it's solid but once again the finishing, I'm not impressed by it. Up front we have the earpiece, the sensors, the front camera, the physical home button here with the ring around it showing us it has a fingerprint scanner, the capacitive back button and the capacitive recent button and that's pretty much it at the front, at the back, we got the main camera, the flash and the heart rate sensor right here next to it and if you remove the cover you need a longer nail for that this is a plastic cover by the way only the sides of the phone are metal this is plastic so under the cover we find the battery and the nano sim car slot that requires you to take out the battery in order to insert the nano sim here okay we proceed further but before that you have to be careful and close all the little clips of the back cover, which as you saw earlier, I didn't exactly do. So at the front we have the audio jack and a mic, while at the bottom we have the micro USB port, mic and speaker, there is no infrared emitter whatsoever on this device. On the left side a very thin volume button, you'll feel it and press it OK, meanwhile the on off button is very thin, exaggeratedly thin and you will basically never find it because it's almost flush with the surface of the phone. So too slim on off button to be comfy. So overall we have a nice feel to this handset, it has an almost premium design but it tends to cut into your palm and the finishing is not very impressive. However from the outside if you look at it, it looks quite nice and it's an ultra slim phone so that's impressive. On the hardware side what we get here is a 4.7 inch screen with a super AMOLED panel, the resolution is modest, 1280 over 720 pixels, 16 million colors available and 312 ppi density. We've got an Exynos octa-core processor inside, is the Exynos 5 octa, the 5430 and this one has 4 cores of the Cortex-A7 kind clocked at 1.3 GHz and 4 cores of the Cortex-A15 kind clocked at 1.8 GHz. The GPU is a Mali T628 and also inside the phone you can find 2 GB of RAM and also 32 GB of storage. 
we get that much storage because of the fact we don't have a micro SD card slot available on board. So let's see what's happening here. Here we go, finally made it. We move forward to the cameras. We have a 12 megapixel back camera with LED flash and 4K video capture and a front 2.1 megapixel camera that supposedly captures full HD video and actually it does. And on the connectivity side, we get 4G LTE, there's Ant Plus for fitness and uh, micro USB 2.0, GPS, GLONASS, there is no MHL, so if you want to let's say connect the phone to the TV set and check out your pics, you cannot do it, there is no MHL. There's Wi-Fi 802.11, AB, G, N, A, C, dual band, MIMO support as well, Wi-Fi direct, there is no DLNA from what I know. Uh, there's NFC though and Bluetooth 4.0 and obviously HSDPA. In the section we like to call others, we got the heart rate sensor, proximity sensor, geomagnetic sensor, fingerprint sensor, hole sensor, gyroscope accelerometer and finally the light sensor. And now as far as the battery is concerned, we're dealing with a lithium ion unit with an 1860 mAh capacity. This one is a 3.85 volt battery and uh, it also comes with a 7.17 watt hour capacity okay and let's see what the battery is all about on paper it provides you with 11 hours of wi-fi browsing or 10 hours of video playback or 37 hours of music in our test that involves looping a video with wi-fi on and brightness of 50 percent we achieved only seven hours and one minute of video playback by the way the brightness was set at 50 percent in the manual slider area which is this one here so it was pretty much like this there wasn't the auto setting, it was only the manual setting, okay? So, 7 hours and 1 minute, you know, it's not very impressive, but it's also not very bad considering how thin the phone is. Still, the iPhone 6 is only a bit thicker and it manages to achieve 11 hours and a half with less of a battery capacity, so we know it could be better. Overall, 7 hours here and the charging takes place in 1 hour and 40 minutes, which is very okay. At least we beat the Nexus 5 and the HTC One M7 with those 7 hours and we also have the usual power saving features. I won't get into detail because every last Samsung phone, the past 3 or 4 phones from Samsung have had similar feature. At least the Galaxy S5 had it, the Galaxy Note 4 had it and here we go, power saving. There are two main options, power saving mode with some sub options. You can restrict the CPU performance, screen output, turn off touch key light, turn off GPS and that's pretty much it. You can also go to a grayscale mode but that will be exemplified in the ultra power saving mode. That goes something like this, here we go. It's a grayscale rendition of your interface only offering access to the main feature and saving a lot, a lot of battery. Basically you get about a day of usage with about 20 or 30% battery. You've known this feature ever since the Galaxy S5, it's been impressive, but now it feels like the usual gimmick from Samsung. Okay, so that's what the ultra power saving mode looks like. All the basic features are here. We got phone, messages and internet, and the connectivity is disabled for now. And now that we're done with the power saving features, I must mention that this phone offers you, on average, about one day or one day and a bit of usage. And by this I mean phone calls, YouTube, Facebook, games and a bit of web browsing. I would say the battery is okay for this thickness of 6.7 millimeters, but nothing else. So 7 hours of playback and meanwhile the Galaxy S5 achieves 11 hours of video playback. And now once the ultra power saving is done, we should go to audio. So we got the speaker here with all those small little holes is no longer at the back, instead at the bottom. And now let's go to the music player section where the content is organized in playlists, tracks, albums, artists, folders and devices plus there is a music square that organizes music by mood so we got calm, exciting, passionate and joyful and there are also other interesting sections here that you probably know already we got the settings with sound alive that is the equalizer there's an auto option, there's also this square that can uh, tailor the music according to genre, rock, pop, jazz, classic, or focus on vocal, bass, instrument, or treble. Then there are the effects, tube amp, virtual 7.1, small room, large room, concert hall, and uh, then the advanced with seven custom channels and three options, 3D, bass, and clarity. So that's the equalizer in a nutshell. Then there's the adapt sound, so you can tweak your acoustic experience, play speed and smart volume that makes all the tracks of equal volume. Now let's actually listen to a tune so we can get a good idea of what's happening here.
Ok, now let's draw some conclusions. First I have to say that the player supports flag files and the sound is uh, clean, crisp, loud and uh, the bass is pretty much ok. Frankly speaking, in spite of the speaker being loud, I've heard louder and when you're listening to a tune that has a guitar or strong percussion, you will hear some distortion and aside from distortion, there's also some metallic sounding vibes from this speaker here, so I'm not exactly impressed. And now the headphones. They're the usual bunch that you saw on the Galaxy S5 and the Note 4. They have a tangle free wire, they have a remote with three buttons, two for volume and one for play pause. They go deep in the user's ear, as you can see here. They are in ear buds. They isolate the sound very well. They're loud and they cancel the noise perfectly. Also, you have a perfect bass thanks to them and they're quite comfy. So, that's the headphone experience also in a nutshell. However, now I have to draw the lines and the acoustics of this uh, handset, the Galaxy Alpha, are below the iPhone 6 and the Galaxy S5, just in case you're wondering. We also have the decibels to prove that. And here we go. This is the decibel meter, it's showing us 83.5 decibels when testing this device. Meanwhile, the iPhone 6 scores 85 decibels and the LG G3 87 decibels. The speaker remains pretty good, but it could be just a little bit better and get rid of the metallic sound and distortion. Now I want to talk about the display, so make sure the brightness is turned all the way up. We have a 4.7 inch here. Super AMOLED 720p, 312 ppi and the pixels are of the Pentile Matrix variety, as you can see here, those are the pixels under our microscope, Pentile Matrix, it's a bit of an older technology, we expected something newer from Samsung, but it should work. The blacks are deep, and let's see the video app, suggestively named video, it's got previews of the files we're about to watch, and let's use, use our usual video sample to test out the screen. Ok, here we go. Now let's see the options of the player, nothing has changed here as well. We got crop options, we got pop up play, move it around, double tap it to enlarge it, also pinch to zoom supported, and other options included here, let's see. Subtitles, we got settings, mini controller brightness, play speed, sound alive and AMOLED cinema that makes everything more vivid when activated and makes the color really pop out, plus subtitles and tag body. And now let's discuss about the video app a bit more. It shows previews, it supports mp4 files, mkv files, it does not support DivX, just in case you're wondering, so no support for DivX. And I have to say that the colors really pop out of the screen and that the screen is bright and very crisp. Ok, now let's continue the video playback. So, this screen offers wide viewing angles, as you can see, you're not missing anything if you're watching the video from an angle, both vertically and horizontally. So, at least the viewing angles are wide, the screen is bright, it's crisp, the colors are ok, there is a slight bit of oversaturation, but you can tweak that from the settings, as you'll see later on, we have good contrast and the sunlight behavior is decent. We also measure the brightness, we couldn't help it. Since we use the microscope to check out the pixels, we use the lux meter to check out the brightness. And it's a pretty good result, 454 lux units. That was achieved with the manual brightness all the way to the top. If you go auto and add 5 units more, you'll notice that the brightness of the screen will reach 15 lux units more, so about 470 lux units would do justice to this phone. Meanwhile, the Sony Xperia Z1 Compact gets 488 lux, it beats this model, and the Galaxy S5 480 lux, well the iPhone 5, excuse me, the iPhone 6 goes all the way up to 570 lux units. In spite of the figures you're hearing here, we still have a very crisp and bright screen, I would say that the 470 lux it offers are enough for excellent movie viewing, excellent gaming, and I didn't exactly feel the lack of those lux units. Um, I have to also say that the resolution is not exactly the best in the world and if you're checking out text for example, even the text of the icons, you'll see that it's not as crisp as you expect it to be or if you compare it to a Quad HD phone or Full HD phone, it's not just as crisp, so it's a 720p screen after all. 
Now we go into the settings area where the display gets its own settings. We have brightness settings, font settings, smart stay. So the screen stays on as long as you're looking at it. Then we have the screen mode. There's adaptive display that adapts to the situation. There's AMOLED cinema that makes colors pop out. AMOLED photo a bit more realistic. And basic which is the setting that Samsung has been using for a while now. There is also touch key light duration and the option to auto adjust screen tone to save some power. And finally you can increase touch sensitivity so you can use the screen better while wearing gloves. Okay, we're done with the screen. Keep in mind it's a good screen. It has enough brightness to go around. Deep blacks and wide viewing angles. A bit oversaturated but that can be corrected from the settings. And now let's deal with the camera. It's a 12 megapixel shooter with a 16 to 9 sensor, f2.2 aperture and focal length of 4.8 millimeters the same focal length of the Galaxy S5. It has face detection autofocus and it does not, I repeat, it does not have optical image stabilization. We got this castle here, using it to demonstrate the photo abilities of the Galaxy Alpha. So the UI is typical for Samsung. We have, uh, let's go back, we have these four settings here, these four options on the left customizable of course we have the front camera shortcut and then these two can be replaced with some of the settings here so if I want to uh, take one there for example if I want to put the timer there I drag and drop it and here we go we're done these two are customizable as I said so basically we have the front camera shortcut two replaceable options or three the settings and now let's enter this area the maximum pixel picture resolution is uh, 4608 over 2592 this is 12 megapixel in 16 to 9 or you can go lower 8.9 megapixels in 4 to 3 there is also the burst shot option picture stabilization option face detection option and um, let's see what else we have here we have the iso mode so let's see what we activated so some of the options aren't on okay here we go now you can see everything iso goes up to 800 only metering modes center weighted matrix and spot tattoo tape pics, selective focus, you'll see later on, and video, you can film up to 4K, there's also full HD, and then there are the video recording modes, we got normal, limit for MMS, slow motion with three options, fast motion with three options, and smooth motion which is basically full HD video at 60 frames per second, there's video stabilization, audio zoom, some effects to play with, including fisheye, faded color, pastel, vignette and more. There's flash options, timer, HDR, location tags, review pics, remote viewfinder, white balance, exposure, volume key to take pics, voice control, grid lines and finally you can reset the settings. On the right side of the screen we have the shutter button, the video capture button, gallery shortcut and the modes. The modes are once again the usual ones, we got auto, we got beauty face, shot and more, Panorama, virtual tour, dual camera, animated photo, sports, sound and shot, surround shot and that's pretty much it. Shot and more creates a series of shots and lets you pick the best one, panorama is self explainable, virtual tour is sort of a 3D panorama, dual camera uses both cameras front and back to take pics, animated photo is basically a GIF, sports catches photos in moving action, sound and shot also adds sound and surround shot is basically a 3D globe of a panorama. You can do zoom up to 4x as you can see right here and now let's actually take a picture of this castle and check out the level of detail here we go 12 megapixel camera decent level of detail at least when the lights are uh, shone upon this castle so I would say the capture looks okay and I would also say that the capture happens pretty fast So fast photo taking but not so fast focus if you ask me. Now we're going to go to the gallery. We have uh, about 100 pictures to show you. And here we go, 130 actually, so we have a ton of them. Let's start with those taken during daylight. We also have some nighttime ones and I have to say from the start that this 16, uh, excuse me, this 12 megapixel camera was just a little bit underwhelming. First of all, we have realistic colors, good details. And we even tried out selective focus for a bit.
this is it this is the selective focus picture so what it does it allows you to focus either on the background or the foreground so you can focus on Winnie the Pooh in the near focus option or focus on the tiger in the far focus option or you can opt for pan focus so this is the selective focus option that I showed you earlier in the modes cleared up here once again I have to say that the pictures are pretty crisp the level of detail is okay but if you start zooming in you'll see that there is a clear difference between this 12 megapixel shooter and a 16 megapixel one. We got a good panorama with OK stitching and OK details and we even played with HDR, so a regular picture, HDR picture. It really enhanced the contrast in this one. There is a slight feeling of undersaturation for most of the pics. It feels like something is missing. I said that the colors are good, but I must also say that something feels like it's missing, so under saturation is the keyword here. Once again, the shots taken with the 12 megapixel shooter are slightly noisier than those taken with the 16 megapixel one, and a keen eye will certainly notice the difference. We also have some zoom pictures, so these are the ducks from a distance, these are the ducks closer, and zoom appears. We also have some swans. You can see them from the distance or zoom in and once again the noise is pretty clear here and the level of detail drops. We also tried some macros with a few toys here and there and let's see a real macro this time like this one attempted here. So first of all we try the macro and then we try to focus both on the cone and on the duck. So focus on the cone, leave the duck out of focus, focus on the duck, leave the cone out of focus. And one more macro, for macro's sake. At least the macros are okay, but once again under saturation and feels less of a camera than the 16 megapixel units. I would say this cam is about 30% less impressive than the Galaxy S5 one, but it certainly beats this Sony Xperia Z1 Compact. I feel compelled to compare this phone to that one because they have smaller diagonals and I feel the need to compare them. So a macro shot of flowers reasonable not very impressive i've seen more impressive ones and we also pulled some night shots so let's check those out it's a jack white concert at first sight it looks impressive but if you zoom in you start seeing a lot of noise and i do mean a lot and blurriness so that's not exactly okay this one here also impressive at first sight zoom in a bit a ton of noise i was pretty much underwhelmed by the low light shots this one is also an example, zoom in a bit, a ton of noise and when you will encounter a street light, this is what happens, halo effect and a fuzz which is not exactly okay. Picture with a flash, picture without a flash, this one is almost decent but still disappointing compared to other models out there. So the slightest zoom causes some noise problems, we also have yellowish hue and you certainly have to struggle a bit to focus properly on the images around you. It's about the same nighttime performance or as the Galaxy Note 3 or a bit less. And now as far as the video is concerned, let's enjoy the vids with the special video app. So first of all, let's start with a slow motion vid. Here we go. Quality is not exactly impressive. These are uh, 120 frames per second videos in 720p. I'm not sure if you can take 240 frames per second videos. Theoretically you should, since the device is capable enough for 4K, you should also do those videos. Anyway, not very impressed by the quality, as you can see it suffers a bit from loss of pixels. Let's see what else we got here, we have more images. So if you remember the red bridge from earlier, it's actually the topic of a 4K video which I find a bit underwhelming. This is the 4K video. It has stereo audio, 48 mega per second bitrate and the audio bitrate is 256 kilo per second. The 4K video quality is certainly below the one of the Galaxy S5, that's for sure. Sometimes it doesn't even look like a 4K video and it even lost the exposure just a little bit. We also have a fast motion videos of some ducks. I hope I can find it. Nope, not this one. So let's try to find those ducks. 
and should be this one. This is the fast motion video. Nothing fancy here, so let's try a stabilization video. I simply walked a set of stairs and then descended it while filming. I did the same thing with the iPhone 6 back in the day and the iPhone 6 Plus. Both were impressive in spite of the fact that the iPhone 6 only has digital stabilization. And as you can see, this model may have some stabilization or not, but it certainly lacks it when filming. So while the iPhone 6 has good digital stabilization, the Galaxy Alpha doesn't. It's a bumpy ride, but it's just a set of stairs after all. Okay, now we're off to see some zooming being tested. One of the samples here, it's the 9051 and let's see the ducks closer. This one is a full HD video at 30 frames per second, 17 mega per second bitrate and let's check out the zoom. The quality is not very impressive, I remember the Galaxy Note 4 and its zoom was crisp clear. We also have a 60 frames per second video in here somewhere. Here we go, it's this one, full HD, 60 frames per second, smooth video, 28 mega per second bitrate. As you'll notice on YouTube, where we'll publish the videos, um, the continuous autofocus is slightly exaggerated at times, and I was surprised by how good the audio capture was in some instances. We even tried some videos a night, like a short snippet of 5 seconds from Jack White's concept before being uh, catched away by guards. But let's go to something more serious. As I said, nighttime capture looks something like this. It's underwhelming, I'll tell you that from the start. Full HD video at night. It's yellowish, it's noisy, it has focus loss, and there's that fuzz around the street lights. And you'll see that fuzz and focus loss better in this video here. So when it comes to low light, I would say we are underwhelmed, both in photo and video action. And now let's draw some conclusions about the 12 megapixel camera on the Samsung Galaxy Alpha. Overall, it's below, let's say, below the iPhone 5S, that's the first comparison that comes to mind. It's even below the second tier flagships of the past year, like HTC One and HTC One Mini, and I'm speaking frankly here, the Galaxy Alpha is beaten by the HTC One, the first one, and the HTC One Mini. It's also 30 or 40% less impressive than the camera of the Galaxy S5. I would put it on par with lesser phones from last year like the LG G2, didn't exactly impress us with its camera so let's put them on par, which is not exactly a compliment for this handset. I expected a bit more but only because I was surprised by the latest Samsung cameras like the Galaxy Note 4, Galaxy S5, Galaxy K Zoom and then comes this model and doesn't impress. You can also edit and tweak your pictures with a variety of settings, we have adjustment, Crop rotate resize, tone, contrast saturation, red, green, blue, temperature, hue, effects. Okay, small tutorial here, blue wash, sharpen, light streak, and more, vignette, some portrait options. Okay, we're done here. Okay, as I said, portrait options and decorations like stickers, stamps, label, frame, drawing and all that. Then there is the video editing mode that you probably already know, also from the studio pack that's offered by Samsung. And now let's analyze the performance of the device, first of all discussing about the temperature. So here we go into the gallery area where we find that we achieved a temperature of 39.8 degrees Celsius after playing 15 minutes of the game Riptide GP2, so there is no overheating here. As far as the web browser is concerned, we got the stock one here, and let's load gsndon.com. As you can see, it's not exactly very fast, I was expecting it to be a bit faster, but now let's get to the keyboard. We're dealing with a comfy keyboard that's well spaced on this 4.7 inch screen, and we have a numeric row at the top which is cool so we don't have to press an area here to get to the numbers part. Okay, next up is the phone section. This is it. We got features like speed dial, a bunch of settings for the 
uh, contacts and calling, we have call rejection, call related pop-ups, call alerts, hide my video, service provider and more. And as far as the calling experience and signal per se are concerned, well, I would have to say that the noise reduction is not very impressive here, basically there is no noise reduction, but we have a crisp sound, it's clear, it's loud, so no problems here, aside maybe from the fact you'll be hearing everything behind the person you're talking to. As far as the software goes, we're dealing here with Android, but let's see what flavor it is. It's Android 4.4.4 and with touches on top. It's a TouchWiz version somewhere between Galaxy S5 and Galaxy Note 4, so you already know it from our tests. And now we're off to the benchmark area. So you're probably wondering what devices I compared the Galaxy Alpha to. So here we go. I compared this model to the Galaxy S5, the iPhone 6 and the Xperia Z3 Compact. The S5 to see the difference in performance, if there is one. The iPhone 6 because the formats are pretty close. Similar batteries, similar screen diagonal, but not similar prices. And also the Xperia Z3 Compact because I consider it a rival for this model, a rival made by Sony. Okay, so here we go. In Quadrant, we scored. 23,473 points, we beat the Galaxy S5 by about 1,000 points and uh, the Xperia Z3 Compact scored 21,000 so we also beat that. In Antutu, a very good score, a surprising score, 48,650, we beat the Galaxy S5 that had 34,712 and the iPhone 6 narrowly beat us with 48,949. Meanwhile, the Sony Xperia Z3 Compact had 43,911. In Nenamark, 60.1 frames per second, the exact same score of the Galaxy S5, while the Xperia Z3 Compact, we don't have its result, I suppose it's pretty close to 60. In Velamo, we scored 23.93 in the HTML test, beating once again the Galaxy S5 by more than 1000 points. Next up, we got 3D Mark, iStorm Unlimited, a pretty good score, 13,899. Uh, we got beaten by the Galaxy S5 and it's 18,000 points. Also beaten by the iPhone 6 and it's 70,000 points and I was very impressed by the 19,000 points of the Sony Xperia Z3 Compact. Next up Geekbench 3, here we scored 944 in the single core test, we beat the Galaxy S5 and it's 854, got beaten by the iPhone 6 and it's 1629. And meanwhile in the multi-core one we have 3114. We beat the Galaxy S5 by 600 points, we beat the iPhone 6 by 200 points, and we beat the Xperia Z3 Compact by also 300 points, so the multi-core test beats all. Finally, we got GFX 12.3 frames per second in the T-Rex 1080p off-screen test. We got beaten by the Galaxy S5 that had 27 frames per second, and the iPhone 6 had 42.8 frames, while the Xperia Z3 Compact had 27.3, so totally beaten in this test. In the speed test, I would say we did pretty well, 23 mega per second download speed, 26 mega per second upload speed, the Galaxy S5 has 23 and 24, and the iPhone 6, 28 and 21, so I would say we're doing very fine. Browser mark 2.1, 1374 is the score here, the Galaxy S5 had uh, 3250, but it was an older version of the benchmark, while the Xperia Z3 Compact has 1500, so it beat us. Finally, Sun Spider, a pretty good score. 460 and the lower the better. Galaxy S5 has 413, it beat us, iPhone 6 354, beat us again, and the Xperia Z3 Compact is inferior with 906 points. This one is an Exynos 5 Octa handset. The processor is uh, based on the process of 20 nanometer manufacturing, and the other models, the Galaxy S5 and Xperia Z3 Compact, have Snapdragon 801 processors, while the Apple iPhone 6 has the Apple A8. So this was a battle between Exynos, Snapdragon and Apple's A8 processor. We won 4 out of 10 benchmarks. And in spite of that, this model I would call it an equal to the Galaxy S5 as far as performance goes. Not exactly as far as GPU goes, but general performance. The benchmarks are pretty good considering the format of the device. We don't have any lag, aside from the usual small delays in the TouchWiz interface and it can run any new game you can throw at it. The UI is the same old TouchWiz you know, plus the brand new icons that came with Lollipop. So as you can see Google updated its Gmail, updated its maps, updated the play services before launching Lollipop. All of them are updated right now. We have a good looking multitasking area. This is it. 
you can close all if you want and uh, the UI version is between the Galaxy S5 and the Note 4 we also have the My Magazine section here based on Flipboard and this is how you check out an article you can also share it on social networks and this part of the interface is optional so if you want to disable it you can do that no problem you can do that from here uncheck this and you're done these are the widgets that come with the device most of them are changed from the stock ones and now let's check out the drop down area where you can find the usual quick settings here and you can see all of them if you do this all of the optional quick settings are here we got the s finder and quick connect brightness slider and notifications and if you access the settings area you'll notice that at the top you can uh, change the view of the settings you can view them as a grid as a list or tab and also at the top you can place some quick settings so if you want the wi-fi for example nfc and more networks to sit at the top you have them right here so you can find them easier then you can uncheck this and change your list or simply give up your favorite settings. Among the stuff that we're interested in here is the download booster that combines LTE and Wi-Fi for an ultra fast connectivity. And next up we have something interesting here. I didn't expect that on such a small device. We have multi-window and yes, it's available even on this small screen. You probably know it from the past Galaxy Note iterations. It goes something like this. Drag an app here, drag an app here, the screen is split into two. You can at the, same, at the same time check out pictures, browse the web and do a variety of other stuff. Listen to music and browse the web. You can also replace the two windows, make one larger or simply close it. And that's the multi-window experience on this smaller screen. We're not done with the settings area, there is much more to look at. So aside from the usual connectivity option that you have here, there's flight mode, NFC nearby devices, screen mirroring. There's the notification panel that's totally customizable and we also have a toolbox. This one is a simple option, you activate it and then you trigger this little dot that can be moved around the screen, pressed. It's a sort of a widget with the apps you need the most and you feel that uh, a shortcut is no longer sufficient so that's why you're using the toolbox. We move further in the settings area and find the easy mode. This one is for people who want a simple experience, a simple interface with bigger tiles, so to say, not the complex statues. Then we got accessibility settings. We also have the blocking mode. So if you want to sleep or you're in the office, you can block calls, notifications, alarm and timer. Then the private mode. If you want to hide some content, that's the way to do it. And then the finger scanner, we already have set up one fingerprint. The process is pretty fast, as is the um, authentication. So let's unlock the device like this. Okay, here we go. Fingerprint lock enabled and recognized in an instant. As I said, very easy authentication and some extras compared to Apple's Touch ID. Let's see those extras. For example, you can sign into websites using the fingerprint, which is pretty cool. And uh, let's do it again. Okay, so aside that, you can also register up to three fingerprints and you can disable your locking mechanism. If you don't want it, you won't have it. And as I said before in the Galaxy Note 4 review, this method of authentication is safer than the one from the iPhone 6, for example, because the password required for you um, is more complex. On Apple devices, you're only required to input, let's say, four letters. Here, you're also required to input a letter and a few numbers, and that's it. Okay, so let's see what else we got here. We saw the toolbox, we saw the blocking mode, private mode, finger scanner, we got motions and gestures like direct call, put the phone to the ear and call, smart alert, device vibrates when you pick it up to notify you about missed calls, some you already know like mute or pause, and then we got the air view. This one is very simple and I'll show it to you in a minute. I activated it, I go to the gallery, and if I put my finger above the screen, I can see previews of what's on the screen, just like we did with the uh, S Pen stylus. The same is applied to the calendar, provided that, that we can find it. So if I float my finger above a date, I'd see what's happening on that date. And that's in a nutshell the air view feature. You can deactivate it and proceed. Accounts, cloud, backup, reset, language, 
and some more options plus ones related to S Planner and ones related to S Voice. Okay, so that's about it. And since I mentioned S Voice, it's still disappointing. It's still below Siri, below Cortana, and below Google now. I won't demo it. If you saw a review of the Galaxy S5 and Galaxy Note 4, you get the gist of it. S Voice is still not up to par. Now, in the app section, we have the pre installed apps. Luckily, this phone doesn't suffer from bloatware, so that's a plus. We have the S Planner, looking sharp as usual. It's interesting to see that on the Galaxy Alpha it's still called S Planner, while on the Galaxy Note 4 it's called Calendar. Then we have the Memo app, pretty self-explanatory. You add a memo, you add a picture, you add a voice recording and a list if you want to. And then we have Voice Recording Studio for your photo and video editing needs. File Manager called My Files, Galaxy Apps which is your Samsung App Store. Then we got the S Health application with its new interface and options for pedometer, exercise, heart rate, food, weight, sleep and stress. These are my last measurements. You can see the stress level here and the heart rate here. You can also measure them. So let's try to measure the heart rate right now. I have to place my finger here and not talk. That's pretty fast, so I'd better give it a rest. Okay, and now you can also check out the stress level. Here we go, stress level also measured the same. And for some reason, it tells me I am not that stressed in spite of the high pulse earlier. Don't take this into account totally because they may vary a lot. Now we have the S Voice, another app, Chrome, Gmail, Google Plus, Maps in its new version with change interface and some elements from Lollipop. As you can see, it looks brand new. The options are here now and everything is more interesting. We also have Play Music, Play Books, Play News, and Play Games, Drive, YouTube, Photos, Hangouts, Play Store and Dropbox and Flipboard and that's pretty much it. That's the pre-installed apps list. As I said, there's no bloatware here or little bloatware, so we're happy about that. And now the verdict regarding the Samsung Galaxy Alpha. Here we go. The pros. On the pro side, we have a new approach for the design. We got metallic edges, we got a very slim waistline. And other than that, we have a powerful CPU, a good display. There's actually nothing I can object about on this screen. We got fast charging, one hour and 40 minutes and it's charged. We have a good daytime camera. So the photos taken during daytime are good, but not excellent. Slightly underwhelming even, but for the device, such a, for such a thin device, I would say they're good. Okay, and finally, no bloatware, which is something we're happy about, especially for a Samsung device. On the con side, on the defect side, the price is a bit too big for what we get. These edges tend to be a bit rough and roughly finished and may cut into your fingers. So you can lose a layer of epiderma if you do something like this. And the finishing is also kind of rough. The speaker is a bit unimpressive. We got poor low light capture for the camera and there is no noise reduction when talking to people on the phone. Let's also give this device some grades. I'm going to give it an 8.5 out of 10 for design, a 9 for the hardware and a 9 for operating system and user interface. The final grade is 8.83 out of 10. We drop 0.83 for the huge price. And the final grade is 8.5 out of 10 here at gsndom.com. This is an experimental phone, just like that uh, curved model that Samsung launched a while ago, the round one. Um, it's a sacrificial phone, so to say it sacrifices the battery a bit, the camera a little bit, and even the speaker just a little bit. It's still a welcome because it adopts metal, finally, answering the requirements of the people who weren't happy with the plastic on Samsung devices. Anyway, it's an excellent alternative to the Galaxy S5 mini and Galaxy S5, but only if you're willing to drop 
camera quality and also to increase the price a bit in some cases. So GSM1.com gives this device a final grade of 8.5 out of 10 right here for the Galaxy Alpha. Bye bye.